So um, we're going to start with just very brief introductions, and I'll let Andrew go first. Oh, OK. Uh, um, unlike some people here who I envy a great deal, I did not grow up on a, in a rural um, childhood. On the other hand, my parents were very into going tramping in the, in the bush. Um, so I was very connected with, with nature through that, the birds, the bush, um, and visiting cousins' farms. So I had that background. And then, you know, a whole string of uh, different occupations, including being a car mechanic, uh, working in a psychiatric hospital, um, furniture design, and, um, and then went to architecture school. Um, and that was pretty interesting. And while I was at architecture school, the thing that really grabbed my interest and my attention was natural building, earth, and then straw bale. Um, and then I became um, involved with the Earth Building Association. He ended up being the secretary 25 years before Tatiana did. Um, and eventually after I graduated from architecture school, rather than ending up in a, a design office being an architect, I got a contract doing research into the environmental impact of buildings. And that sort of set the direction of my career. I ended up doing a PhD that was called Global Sustainability in the New Zealand House. I wanted to know, how do you make a sustainable house? What does that sustainable actually mean when you get right down to it? And how do you know when the house is sustainable? I mean, I go around on these Earth Building Association house tours and people say, well, you know, I've got the solar panels, I've got the composting toilet, I've got the insulation, I've got the passive solar design. But is it sustainable? And no one can answer the question. So that's what I said to answer. And, um, and you know, the answer I came up with was that, yes, it is possible really difficult unless the whole planet does it together so and that's not going to happen we're not going to find a, here's the change sorry we are not going to find a sustainable way for eight billion people to live on the planet it just doesn't work the numbers the numbers don't work they can't be made to work um and so that's got a lot of implications um and so i did that and then did a lot of Life cycle analysis helped set up the Life Cycle Association of New Zealand and then became disillusioned with it because I could see it was just putting a green stamp on companies who just wanted to carry on doing the same thing they were doing um, and got more interested in this sort of thing in, in, in setting up a lifestyle where I could make these things happen. And that's why I'm here so that I can learn and I've learned a huge amount here already. And that's, that's great for me. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'm Nathan Sarandran, um, born in the UK, um, half Indian. Um, my father's from Kerala in southwest India. Um, I lived in the UK, did an engineering degree, travelled a bit, Canada, New Zealand, back to the UK, back to, Canada, back to New Zealand in 2010 after about a decade of engineering in the UK. I became a chartered professional engineer. Took a bit of time out because I got made redundant, read Limits to Growth and some other stuff and started to realise there's a bigger energy story than just the renewable energy system. You know, we put the largest PV array in Europe on the roof of a building in central London in 2001 and the largest ground source heat pump array underneath the building in central London in about 2008-9. So, you know, big engineering projects, background really was confronted with the reality of the energy situation, which we're going to talk to you about this morning. And that led me to move my family to Invercargill <laughs> um, and really start asking some hard questions about what sustainability actually looks like. I've been teaching part-time at the Polytech, doing a variety of entrepreneurial things, installing retrofit double glazing and running a juice bar and, you know, quite a diverse range of activities um, that have led me to, you know, really trying to help shape a conversation around local foods, in in the cargo i'm also involved with the wise response society that is trying to bring this limits conversation to the national level to so we lobby somewhat ineffectively government to try and take this stuff into account um, in their policy and planning um stuff um and i am um, we it based on a couple of hectares down in south in the with my partner ella and we've just built over the last few years an off-grid um, photovoltaic plus batteries house, a low energy house. It's you know got some passive solar features and so on. And um, we are trying to figure out how to use 
the lands that we're stewards of in a in a way that um, provides for our future um, community well-being I guess you'd say in a broad sense so that's roughly where I am um, I'm now going to give you a, just a quick apology and say that some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning are things that will raise your cortisol levels a bit you know you'll feel a little bit stressed out by them please stay with us through this you know it's, it's important to recognize up front that this is going to be not you know something that you particularly want to hear. I don't like giving these talks but I feel it's important that we when we're talking about the future be it the future of land use or the future of our built environment or whatever it might be that we start with a realistic understanding particularly of the energy story because energy underpins everything that humans do you know all of our GDP activity really is diesel and kerosene and petroleum expenditure you know to a large extent well comes from energy. I mean, you know, yep. real wealth, being able to do things yep. comes from energy. Yeah, our ability to do can't work. Little, and to give you an away. example of just how much of an advantage we get, I was talking just before in the break to some guys about the fact that, you know, if you think about um, how many slaves it would take to run a farm and do the sorts of work that a tractor and um, a couple of quad bikes and, you know, a couple of contractors coming in with sprayers and all the rest of it do, um, Think about the fact that a single barrel of oil, which costs what, roughly 100 US dollars on the open market, has the human labor equivalent of four and a half years of continuous work. So one person working continuously 24 seven at maximum output for four and a half years is the same amount of energy in terms of the work that it can do for us as a single barrel of oil. So that's the, the anomaly that we're living in, this brief anomaly of the last couple of hundred years of industrialization. And it's that that really, um, I'm apologizing for telling you, is it's coming to an end because it, it really is. And, and, um, and I'll just throw in here that, that I'll echo this, that I mean, we only met each other yesterday, yeah. but we've obviously been saying this to groups for a long time. And it's always really uncomfortable for me to, to be in the Cassandra role, mm. but it looks like someone's got to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to start with a statement, which is oil is a finite resource. I don't think there's too much argument about that. Um, but as it becomes harder and more expensive to, ex to find and extract the remaining reserves, the cost of using oil will continue to rise. However, there's another issue with our reliance on oil that is less well known, because I think people kind of understand that and they understand, well, they can see increases in oil prices you know, on a general upward trend over time. And that is the net energy of our oil system. Now I talk about oil specifically because oil is what you could think of as the master resource. You know, diesel specifically is the thing that makes all of our industrial activity possible. It runs the mining vehicles, it runs the logistics, it runs the um, construction equipment that build the manufacturing facilities, it runs the logistics from the manufacturing facilities to the ports, to the ships, to the end use at the other end, and all of the maintenance of the equipment that we build again. Is and it runs the farms. It. Runs the farms, exactly, exactly. Um, and net energy which is the energy we get from our energy sources minus the energy required to extract, transport and process those sources. So we use a lot of diesel actually in running the oil extraction infrastructure that we have globally. And that proportion is increasing fast at the moment. So people talk. And you can't switch it to electricity or something else. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it, it is true and people will point to the fact that, you know, the likes of um, Caterpillar and so on are starting to put massive like megawatt hour batteries into enormous mining trucks and that that sort of thing is happening. Um, uh, but you've and, got to make the batteries, you've got to exactly. mine the, the material to yeah, make the batteries. Yeah. And um, because in a growth economy, all of the energy that we currently produce is, is used in one form or another, it's spoken for. The, the, the surplus outside of the extraction of the oil reserves is the bit that we use to do everything else in society. So our agricultural well, activities. Just to say, you can't just say, okay, well, let's switch all the mining vehicles to be electric and then grab the electricity from the existing supply because 
there's not that much spare. So we need to build out not just the, the um, equipment, like the batteries and so on, but then also we need to double or triple grid capacity, people are talking about, you know, and that's to maintain business as usual. And I think what we, what we start to get to is that as we use up the easy to ex access oil, we have to rely on lower quality and harder to extract sources, which require more energy to extract. So think um, in the US, the hydraulic fracking operations over the last 10 years, which have never really been profitable. They've been financed by 0% interest finance functionally. So they, they Do you want to bring in the uh, economic aspect at this moment? Um, just, I'll go a little, a little bit. bit further and then we'll do it. Yeah. Um, and, and so, because instead of it being a big pool of oil under the ground, you can kind of stick a straw in it, you can think of it as, and suck it out, um, and it just comes straight out. The fracking is drilling down and then out horizontally for kilometers, pushing explosives down those holes, fracturing, literally high, uh, fracturing the rock, and then pushing um, coarse sand in to hold the fractures open so that the oil can source, seep out of the source rock. And that type of oil is a, is a much lighter type of oil generally than the heavy crews from the larger fields that we've been reliant on. So that as well as putting more energy into those activities like fracking to extract the oil, the oil that's coming out, it has less utility because it's a You can't light, make diesel out of it. Yeah, it's, it's much harder to make diesel out of it, you know. And, and what, what we, in the US, for example, you know, there's talk of the shale revolution and the fact that you know, they've, they've become energy independent. Well, what they've been doing is importing quite a lot of um, Russian sour crude, you know, the heavier stuff, and from various other places, blending that with the lighter stuff to get to something somewhere in the middle that is diesel. And um, as, as, you know, other factors like geopolitical factors, COVID, etc., have come to play over the last few years, you know, we start to see some real challenges to the continued function of our energy supply. And that has knock-on effects. Um, the biggest effect is, and this is where we fail in terms of our planning and our economic analysis of the situation. Um, economists, when they're looking at this situation, they say, well, you know, we spend maybe 3 4% of our GDP on oil products. So therefore, you know, if we have a 50% or, well, let's, let's just take a less extreme number, 10% drop in the oil supply, that's only going to be, you know, maybe 0.3, 0.4% of GDP that falls away. Failing to recognise that energy advantage in terms of the actual amount of energy in a single barrel of oil and the fact that allows us to do all of these things. And Tim Garrett, who's a physics professor in the US, has done analysis that shows that as your rate of energy use in society goes up, your GDP goes up with it. And it's a one-for-one -one relationship. So, you know, a 10% drop in in energy input is a 10% drop in GDP. And it really is that simple. And actually we've got empirical evidence from Germany and places in, in the last few years that supports that argument. And it shows that, you know, the economic analysis is wrong and it's a much larger effect. And it's much more impactful to have even a small drop in this than, than we've previously really accepted at the society level. And that then has knock on effects to our financial system and our economic system, which Andrew's gonna give you some thoughts on. Um, yep, so the fracking industry, for example, um, has, you know, w w we basically got to, to peak conventional oil, conventional oil in the early 2000s, and then we got saved by um, sweet, light, sweet crude, well, light, light oil from fracking. But that industry has relied on very low interest rates. So those companies who do it are only able to operate at very low interest rates. And so what we've got at the moment where interest rates are going up and they're going up because um, the Federal Reserve and the states was forced into it because um, they kick-started inflation um, through their, their, their money printing and their, and their low rates, then those industries become unsustainable. And that's now, it's happening now. You know, they're going offline. And so that fracking, um, component of the of the global energy supply, the oil supply, is significant, and particularly at the moment, um, you know we're in we're in a war. Don't need to go into the politics of it, but that's how it is. Um, plenty of people saying it's the third world war. It's just getting a slow start, um, and that's hitting you know the energy supply in the ways that we know. You know Russian oil is not going to to Europe; it's going to other places. So 
the whole thing, which was working in a fairly carefully balanced way, gets a disruption, and the rest of it doesn't just carry on working in a, and you, you can't just, you know, take a bit from over here. Um, so the economic system for fracking, you know, is significant, but the economic system is, as a lot of people have been saying for, for, for a long time, in a, in a very delicate situation. And I probably a lot of you already know that in the last week, um, Silicon Valley Bank went under in the States and then, and then various other ones, there's a cascade effect. Um, it's happening now. So this is gonna disrupt everything. I mean, you know, everything connects through the economic setup globally and it's being disrupted. And, you know, I mean, how do we summarize this? Well, maybe the easiest way is to say that in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression. But if you look at the economic break that we're going to experience, which is, looks like it's already started, it's going to be the Greater Depression, as it has been called. We're gonna head into something which is more hard hitting than the 1930s Depression. And that'll disrupt all sorts of things. It's, it's not just energy supply, it's the social impact. I mean, you look at the 1930s depression, you could see the social impact. So all sorts of things stop working. You know, the economics go down the gurgler. Um, and that, that has another impact on the energy supply. Um, and when there's a lot of global politics involved, and we happen to be, you know, the last stop for the oil tankers you know we can we can easily imagine the oil tankers are going to say well you know you're either going to have to pay an awful lot more for us to send our tanker down there or we're just going to send it to closer destinations yeah. so and those closer destinations generally have larger more capable military capacity to actually demand that resource as well yeah, so yeah, yeah. you know it's very likely that new zealand will see a significant contraction in oil supply and possibly in the next year or two you know um it's it, it's a real risk and i think it's it's not very well understood um so should we i wanted to talk about um when we talk about things in these terms it's a bit of a downer right <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it really you know i mean i just just standing here talking about it and i've been trying to sit with this over the last 10 years or so you know you can feel your stress levels rising and you're like what do i do and you know this feels very um very very limiting but actually i point to a few things so one thing is that um the this the psychology of of the of the herd if you like is something that you don't have to participate in you know you can unplug yourself to a certain extent from that broader panic that sets in and actually take some deep breaths and andrew's going to do a little meditation exercise at the end of this to help us to ground ourselves again um, but actually allow ourselves to have a better sense of um, of the relative importance of all these things. So it's true that humans have existed for hundreds of thousands of years before this point. It's true that we have diminished the carrying capacity of the planet through our impacts on ecosystems and so on. It's true that we have agency at the individual level and we can make better choices towards things like regenerative farming activities. But I would urge you when you're doing that to bear in mind that because of this energy story that we're un un unpacking here, um, one of the key things that you're going to have to think about is actually how can I simplify my operations? How can I remove dependencies on these things? And you know, some of this is stuff um, around, um, you know, using animal manures more effectively in a farming system, that sort of thing, which, which is part of the regenerative kaupapa. And I think that's really fantastic, but it, 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 we also really need to think hard about that broader systemic reliance on oil supply. There is still, whilst we have productive capacity and room to manoeuvre, opportunity to innovate in terms of industrial products that we might need and um, you know I think that from what I can tell 
you know, investments in things like battery electric vehicles and so on in the long term are not sustainable and in the long term are not going to make sufficient difference to sustain the system that we have. But in the immediate future, if you've, as we have personally at our place, invested in some PV and batteries and an EV, then you're actually in a place where you can be um, mobile to a degree and you can be a... Um, a blessing to your community through the resources that you can share with them in that sense. And um, I, I use the word blessing and it automatically sort of conjures up notions of, um, of, 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 you know, religious language and spirituality. And I think another thing that I want to say along those lines is that, you know, we've got this material standard of living that we've achieved, which is up here somewhere in, in, you know, overdeveloped OECD nations. And, um, you know, the global average might be here. And the historical global average for humanity is down here somewhere. And so from our position, because we're, you know, so far up the cliff face, <laughs> you know, coming back down looks quite painful, right? But if we actually kind of stop and panic, and don't just let go of the ropes and fall and actually start to climb back down proactively, then we can actually reduce the risk to our communities. And what we lose in terms of material standards of living as we go back down, you know, we have this massive mental health crisis. We have these, um, you know, these, these people who are just living miserable lives in isolation and we're social animals. And, you know, fossil fuels have allowed us to go, you know, I'm my own man, I can do my own thing and I don't need community. And actually, one thing that is going to be a benefit as we go through this great simplification and how we can thrive through it is by actually accepting that and looking at how we can work collaboratively and work in community to address some of these issues because it is community level sufficiency. So that everything we've heard here so far, it's in the right direction. You're yep. doing the right things. Yeah. This is, this is the future, as Robin said this morning. Yeah. Um, but we yeah. still have to think about, okay, how are we going to charge the electric vehicle? Um, yeah. And, yeah, and, there, there you know, I, th I think it's, it's really just, it, it helps provide a stepping stone. For example, you know, the, the electric vehicle that's being used on the Longwood Loop, you know, um, that's not susceptible to petroleum dis supplies, so it's more of a resilient um, fo food um, system in the short term. In the longer term, yeah, there's challenges, and you know we can we can talk about those a little bit. But you know there are there are some things that if you've got relatively low debt and you can take on a little bit to do some of these types of things, I think that they are sensible. Um, we, there was a discussion in the last session about the internet and so on. You know that there are there will be localized opportunities, but grab the information that you need now. Don't rely on it being somewhere out in the ether. Have it stored locally, I think is a good good suggestion. Um, and, I, and, 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 and when you're thinking about that, it's worth bearing in mind that we're not just talking about an energy situation and a, and a social impact situation. We are in a war. And uh, the discussion around cyber attacks has been very strong recently. It's a distinct possibility. How, how far that goes, we don't know. Um, but if you're in a world war, it could be quite extensive. Um, so, yeah, I yeah. mean, having the data, yeah. the data as well as everything else local yeah. is really yeah. important. Yeah, but more than that, I think, was, well, we need to use that information actively, right? And so, you know, it's one thing screwing away loads of information. I've kind of done that obsessively. And if anyone wants, like, resources on low technology approaches to, you know, farming and all the rest of it, I've got... A, a lot of information of that nature scrawled away, but it's actually using it as well and um, using it in community. There's a quote from a, a, economist, a British economist called David Fleming that I'd like to uh, end on, which kind of summarises this nicely, which says that localisation, you know, the, the, the local use of all of our collective capacity to meet this future well, um, stands at best at the limits of practical possibility but it has the decisive argument in its favour that there will be no alternative. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we really just need to sit with that reality and ex be accepting of that and start to broaden this conversation out. Because, you know, alongside a, a lot of people, when they hear regenerative farming and so on, they immediately think greenies, you know. And actually, this is... This is an argument that speaks to the conservative side of society that says, you know, this is risk management, guys. You know, this is actually 
protecting our community, you know, and I think that's a really interesting narrative to develop as well over time as we as we start to see these impacts, because the other reality is that there's people who are forward thinking, who sort of intuit the future, and then the, the majority of people have to experience it directly, right? And so, you know, the, ch the conversation in the lead into the election around climate change is changing rapidly because, you know, the majority of our population is on the North Island and North Island's really being hammered by it this last couple of months. And so, you know, we are really starting to see shifts in that conversation. But if that conversation is energy blind, as a lot of conversations in society are at this point, then, you know, it's of limited utility because we'll make decisions to build back the same or reliant on much, you know, more of this high tech approach, which in a literal and absolute sense is unsustainable. That means it, it cannot and it will not be sustained. And so, yes, by all means, make use of technology. You know, we've got Starlink. It's, it made sense for us because, you know, it's fast, it's portable, it's relatively low um, energy um, for our off-grid situation. But, but recognizing that it may well go away and what we do next, you know, there's a, there's a lot of technologists out there who are working on that kind of mesh network, local grid, internet type stuff. And there's, there's some exciting things happening in that space. But yeah, we need to start getting out and talking to each other more, doing more of this sort of event. And I'll just give, you know, props to the organizers and say, you know, this is just, it's great to get people together and talk in this way because it's such an essential thing for, for the future. Um, We've got a few minutes for questions, if anyone has specific questions, and then... I'll, I'll just add a couple of things yep, there. Yep. Um, there's a, a nice quote that, that I carry around, is... What must happen, will happen. Hmm. And the corollary is, what cannot continue, won't continue. <laughs> and this is the hard part for us, because, you know, it's not just dealing with, with what happens, it's, it's imagining what it'll be like, and preparing before it happens. And, you know, the, we are the right people to be doing that, but it's still hard. It's like folding your arms the wrong way. It's just, and, and, and imagining it is difficult. So, I mean, that's the point of, of saying this, is to, is to give a heads up. We're, we're doing fantastic things and the, the localization, um, you know, and the regeneration, brilliant. Um, and fantastic for me to learn about that because I know this is the thing. But we also need to think about the energy situation, the economic situation, the social cohesion situation, all taking a bad turn. And what are we going to do for each of those? You know, we, we, we set up a place because um, the soil is good, the climate's okay, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice community. But what's that going to look like? What's that community, you know, not, not just our own, but the, 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 the wider community going to look like? when the social breakdown happens, when you've got people in the cities who are really struggling and they're going to go out, all right, let's go and get some resources out of the countryside. Yeah. What's it going to be like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't have the answers to all of these things, but they're things that we need to think about and you all have your own answers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Heads up. Okay. Um, questions? Which, um Tesla actually developed a energy source from uh, up top. Yes. That didn't require batteries and things. Yes. I haven't managed to get on top of it. But yeah. to me, that seems to bypass. I mean, I'm what? using cosmic ray transmitters. Yep. And they've got a horrendous amount of power. If you stand next to them, you get what we found yep. 20 minutes, three So, what three. you're talking about there is electrical energy. And electrical energy in New Zealand is probably around 30% of our total primary energy use. The other 70% is fossil fuels. And of that fossil fuels, around a third is oil and particularly diesel, which actually runs all of the um, things. So, you know, the idea that um, if we had an abundant source of free electricity, that would solve our problems. Unfortunately, it won't because of the non-substitutability of oil in a lot of these larger scale systems at the scale that they currently are. Yes, we can have an electric mining truck, we can imagine it, we can build it, we can market it, but how many of those can we realistically build in the time frames given the rates of mineral supply and so on? And that's another 
critical co constraint on activity. Um, so yes, you know, those sorts of things are possible. They may be part of a future where we actually have smaller scale systems that use... And there some are two ways of looking at it. There's the, the local scale, and if you can make it work, and make it work at a local scale, fantastic. Yep. So that, you know, people in localised, regenerative, permacultural situations can have an energy supply, great. At a, at a global scale, free energy would be the worst thing. I mean, you know, we are in this mess because, we talked about, you know, wealth comes from energy. We are in this mess because we've had so much cheap energy. Give us more cheap energy, what are we going to do with it at a global scale? Yeah. Make an even bigger mess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter whether yeah. it's coming, you know, it's a Tesla idea or, um, you know, commercial cold fusion. Doesn't matter. You get a cheap energy source, we'll make a mess with it. Yeah, yeah. Locally, yeah, great. Mm. Yeah. So energy alternatives like hydrogen. Yeah, um, uh, so very simply, hydrogen is extremely economic, extremely difficult to store and transport, and will never be sorry, extremely inefficient, sorry, not economic, and will therefore never be economic at the sort of scale that we're talking about. You know, the idea of this hydrogen plant to replace the electrical consumption from TY at some point, and then exporting that to Japan or so on, is an energy illiterate <laughs> activity, which fundamentally has no future. And so, you know, people can talk about it, they can do all of the research, Fundamentally, you're talking to people who are trying to sell you something and relying on them for the technical appraisal of the solution they're selling you. It's not a very sensible strategy as a consumer. And, you know, if you think of society as a consumer listening to, you know, the consultants and the manufacturing firms who are, you know, rightly from their own limited t frame of reference, protecting their business opportunities going forwards by doing this sort of thing, it, 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 that's what they think. Unfortunately, the fundamentals do not stack up. And it's not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. Yeah, yeah, like batteries. And so if you compare a hydrogen fuel cell um, car, for example, to a battery electric car, the hydrogen fuel cell car will cost about three and a half times as much to run and use about five times as much electricity to generate the, hy the hydrogen and store it and transport it as if you just put the energy straight into the battery electric um, vehicle in the first place. So the economics are not going to work, I promise you. There's a lot of people who are making money off selling the, the, te the idea of it, but the reality of it is very different. Otherwise, we'd have done it 50 years ago. It's not like it's a new thought, you know? And it was looked at. This is, I think, the third or fourth big sort of global push for, you know, hydrogen as a potential, you know, my dad, who was an um, engineering um, lecturer back in the 1980s, you know, was involved in some work in the UK that looked at that kind of, um, you know, what are the alternatives? And, and again, it didn't take off then. The, the reason why it might take off now, people point to, well, better technology, better materials, etc. Not good enough, unfortunately. And, and, and the fundamentals of transforming energy from one form to another repeatedly, like you're doing with hydrogen. Each time you transform the energy, you have transformation losses. And that's the fundamental inefficiency of hydrogen relative to direct use of the electricity that's going to make it uneconomic. That's not to say that small scale things won't happen. You know, HWR have put that 1.1 megawatt electrolyzer in at um, Gore and they're running dual fuel hydrogen and diesel trucks. Look around the world, look at where that's already been tried, you know. There have been people who've put years of effort and billions of dollars of investment into similar initiatives globally elsewhere. Guess what? Three or four years after starting and commissioning those things, they're walking away from them and saying it's just ne not economic. Uh, yeah, to some degree, biogas, um, anaerobic digestion provides a, a path for places that have a surplus of biological material to... And that's one of the things that, you know, we can think about as a, yep. as a, as a, a step. I know Cape Valley, they get quite a substantial amount of methane that comes out from yep. here. Right. I believe Glory Vale yep. Yep. use it in these sorts yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, small scale, mm -hmm. you know, scale. you can do it. That does does, does that then scale up to, say, run, you know, 
a whole load of our existing transport fleet on, with gas converted engines? Probably not because of the scale involved and the investment and the time scales to put the, build that out. You know, we're talking about a change that's occurring now and that's going to just ramp up over the next few years. We are out of time, really. So, so luckily for you know, people like us, there are these things. Yeah. At a societal level and at a global level, they don't work. Um, yeah. So we can say we will have some answers, yeah. but globally there aren't any answers, and that will have impacts because you know whatever proportion of the eight billion population, you know, is going to miss out, that's going to cause a lot of social impact. I like a lot. So what you're actually saying is not actually. Uh, We've got a few things like electric motor that are plugging a few holes in a sinking boat, but yeah. invariably it's just prolonging the oh. sinking boat. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. So, so, that, so there's not the technology as yet. Actually. There, there, there won't be the technology because we're out of time to develop it, market it, commercial, uh, sorry, develop it, commercialise it, market it and deploy it at the scale would, that would be required to make a material difference. Even if there was something waiting in the wings that was discovered tomorrow, you know, we don't have time for that shift to occur relative to the decline rate of the fuel supply that powers industrial society. And, you know, all of the debt yeah, problems that and, Andrew and, talked and about. And there are things like um, the Haber-Bosch um, fertiliser process that uses um, gas to, to, to make fertilizer. I mean, look what's happening, you know, from the war, you know, yeah. fertilizer really hard to get, really expensive around the world. Um, and that impacts the, the, the population. Mm. Yeah. What about uh, large solar farms that I think there's some utility to those in, New, in the New Zealand context, um, if nothing else, to provide a bit of resilience in the grid infrastructure. You know, we've start seen on North Island what happens if you have, you know, centralised power distribution and um, I mean power generation and then long distribution um, networks. Um, they break and um, you've got communities that are still without power, you know, a month after the event. So um, the, the, a lim there's a limited pl uh, apl applicability for that. I would say that it needs to be careful that it's not too large scale you know there's talk of like you know i think the biggest one in new zealand that's commissioned and sorry that's um developed and is in the process of being commissioned is something like a 35 megawatt um array and on the north island and you know those are big systems and they require you know a lot of grid infrastructure then to distribute that power again whereas you know you put a few solar panels on your roof a bit of batteries you can have some limited uh, ability to to function outside of that wider dysfunction and, and assuming that you've built somewhere that isn't flooded or yeah windy. and i was going to say the other aspect to, to, to that is the, the grid is vulnerable it's vulnerable to, to climate change i mean you know power lines Power, like, power pylons get blown over. It's happened. Um, and then there's the, you know, there's the, the human factor. If you, you need engineers and a supply chain, yeah, from a functioning global supply, supply chain, chain yeah. to keep it working. Yeah. And that supply chain is not just vulnerable; it's already being impacted, as we've seen. Yeah. yeah. I think we had a question from um, Dylan. Um, uh, nuclear. Yeah, I think nuclear. I would say you know the 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 energy return isn't terrible um the permitting side of things is extremely challenging particularly in the new zealand context um global experience of things like hinkley point c in the uk is that you know the cost overruns have blown out the budget on that by a factor of four or five already and it's still only half built you know it's not properly commissioned there's another uh, thing to say about that is that the U.S., who was a, you know, one of the leaders in, in nuclear, they haven't built a nuclear power plant for how many decades? Yeah, 30, yeah, yeah. 40? something like that. Yeah, um, they've lost this. They've lost the skills. That's right. The yeah. engineers who yeah. used to know this stuff. Yeah, they're gone. Yeah, they, 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 they've retired or died. Yeah. And so and it's, and it's not something you can go to university and learn all of that engineering stuff. It's it's, it's like an artisanal thing. You know, it was it was handed on. Yeah. Word of mouth. The, the, the and so the, the, the global capacity to actually build a nuke nuclear plant is much more limited. It exists in Russia and pretty much nowhere else. Mm. And, and you get these huge well, cost overruns. Yeah, and, and people talk about things like small modular reactors and so on, and this idea that we can you know, have these little mobile 
um, nuke plants sitting in your backyard and so on. I mean, we've, we've, we've heard this before, right? You know, this was talked about before. And yes, we've got some better materials technology, some better control systems. But again, the fundamentals of containment of nuclear materials are still unsolved. And you know, there's very few of the large scale um, long term storage facilities commission that was part of the yeah. promise of the original nuclear build out. Yeah. And so what you've got is 440 nuclear power plants globally. Of those 440, most of them have had a, a spent fuel pool, which was designed originally to hold a certain amount of fuel and to cool it for a decade or so. It drops to a certain temperature where you can actually put it into an air-cooled casket and then put it underground somewhere in one of these long-term storage facilities. Because nobody wants them in their backyard, they haven't been built. And the, you know, there's some challenges in terms of finding the right geologically stable places, of transporting the materials as well as being a hugely problematic thing. So. It's, it's basically just sitting next to the nuclear plants. So, you know, one of the factors when I um, realized about, you know, this, this bigger picture of, of that is, is, is a factor that very much pointed to Southland and Invercargill being a desirable place to be because it's pretty much as far as you can go away from all of that, which is primarily in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's not that we're immune to it. And there will be impacts as industrial society unwinds. And um, those people who've thought about this deeply have talked about perhaps some sort of um, almost like a sacrificial guild of citizens who choose to um, work to limit the impact of that on the broader society at the expense of their own lifespans, you know, um, and, and we are going to have to make some very challenging decisions around things like that. Um, and in, in the New Zealand context, uh, it doesn't work, you know, the, the, the cost and the scale, and you can't really just have one, you've got to have, you know, two or three. Yeah, because of um, the infrastructure required. And, and we don't and have the population, for the population or the, or yeah. the economy to, to yeah. sustain it. We've got Huntley, rig like that. <laughs> temporary issue, temporary yeah. solution. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I know the substations, um, I live in the Waimak district, and the substation that's out at Sefton, the, the power company has actually brought 80 acres and intending to put a solar there, and, and their intention is to buy either next to every substation or their ads nearby. Mm. Mm. My other concerns is um, we've had friends come out with radiation detections and things with solar. There's a huge amount, uh, not with the solar, but with the inverters mm -hmm. that actually expel quite a high and dangerous. Oh, what kind of radiation? Uh, just uh, electromagnetic yeah. field. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Please ask us some more questions afterwards. Um, Andrew's going to leave. that session because as I said it is upsetting we recognize that we want you to go away with the sense that you can and you don't just have to go into this panic mode you can actually recenter yourself take this information forward and use it positively and productively in your life <laughs>